Well, good morning, class. Good morning. I trust that you had a good night's rest. Everybody slept well? Yeah. All right, well, I know it's the first class of the morning, so would you mind standing with me? It's all right. And I'd like for us to start with a exercise, which of course you're familiar with as counselors, uh, the breathing technique. But just to get us going, get the blood flowing, and get us in the mode of class today, would you uh, let's try, try this breathing exercise. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to inhale when I say inhale, and then you exhale when I say exhale. Also, I'll probably say if you reach up, I reach low. So inhale, reach up really high, and inhale, inhale, and exhale, let it go. Inhale, reach up really high, and let it go. And we'll try one more time. Inhale, Reach up really high, really high, really high, and let go. All right? It's good? All right, excellent. So let's jump right in today. Um, we're in chapter 5 of our text, um, our next text, and we're going to be talking today on the topic, Connecting uh, Experiential Education and Reflection uh, for Group Counseling in Schools. So we'll, we'll talk today a little bit from Wes, in chapter five, this idea of really experiential learning, and that's where we're going to go today. Hopefully, you've been keeping up with your reading. Also, want to remind you, as always, make sure you're taking good notes uh, for your your files for your learning. All right, but if we're going to talk about experiential learning, um, I, I feel like the best way to do that is to actually experience what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to ask you to stand again. <laughs> And we're going to begin uh, with a suggestion to stand on this side. So everybody on this side. So again, we're talking about this idea of connecting experiential education and reflection for group counseling in schools. All right. So uh, those of you who will find yourself in a group, uh, a, a group counseling setting in, in, in schools, this will kind of give you some insight. All right, so we're going to do an activity. It's called Cross the Line. And what will happen is I have a line going down the center of the room, so to speak, and I'm going to read um, a list of, of, of phrases or thoughts, and if it applies to you, I'm going to cross the line. So let's come a little bit closer. Don't be afraid. So I'm going to read a list of experiences, and if it applies to you, I want you to cross the line. You got that? Everybody got that? Okay. Great. So across the line, if you know what it feels like to be new to a school, community, or job, cross the line. Good. Cross the line if you've ever been hurt by someone you love. Cross the line. <laughs> cross the line if you've ever been teased for wearing glasses, braces, a hearing aid, the way you talk, the way you act, the clothes you wear, about your height, your weight, your complexion, about the shape, size, or appearance of your body. Cross the line. All right, we're doing good. Cross the line if you've ever been lied on. If you've ever been lied on. All right, doing good. Cross the line. If you've ever felt alone or unwanted, cross the line. All right, so you go on that side. Cross the line if you've ever experienced burnout. If you've ever been burnt out, if you've ever experienced that, cross the line. All right? Cross the line if you've ever questioned your place in life. Cross the line. And you on that side. Cross the line if you regret something in life and wish that you could change it. Just a few more. Cross the line if you've ever treated someone differently because of what they can do for you. Cross the line.
cross the line if you've ever said or done anything that would border or be interpreted as a lack of integrity. Cross the line. And cross the line if you left a pressing need at home. Cross the line. Pressing need at home. Thank you. All right, you may be seated. All right, so the process our activity, the cross the line activity, I'm going to ask you to take just about maybe two minutes. I don't want you to think through uh, just, you know, what happened with this activity, the impact it had on you. And we've been talking to you about uh, reflection journals. So if you go ahead in your reflection journal and just journal a little bit uh, about how did this activity impact you. Take just about two minutes in your reflection journal. Talking a little bit about how this impacted you. We'll do just about two minutes on that. Again, we're talking about connecting experiential education and reflection for counseling in school, school counseling. Take about another minute or so. Sure, that was the shortest two minutes. All right, what I'd like for you now to do is, if you would get in pairs, uh, and perhaps what we'll do is, um, we'll probably have a group of three, a group of two, and in your pair, so I had you think through it, now I'd like for you to pair up. And I'd just like for you to share a little bit uh, uh, from what you thought through in your reflection journal about your experience. So if you do that in your pairs, and in this case, try out.
Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else can relate to that? But this was kind of this is what I'm hearing um, Diane say. Um, for her, it was almost like this gave her an opportunity to kind of put some things, and she used the word confess, right? Yeah. Can anyone else relate to that? Learning. 
according to the West text. So, the experiential approach to family therapy believes that clients should have a what? Experience. Good, one good. Experiential teaching and learning believes that the most powerful learning experiences occurs by what? Doing. Good. The experiential theory believes that the student gains knowledge from his or her own actions, perceptions, and what? Personal involvement. All right, excellent. And we'll do one more. In terms of uh, experiential education, experiential education places an emphasis on what? Reflection. Excellent. Any questions, any thoughts on that? Let's pause for a moment and any thoughts on that. Is it making sense, this idea of experiential learning, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah, yes. just one, because um, it's one thing when, when you learn about theory, it's you learn it and you tend to forget it when you actually do something. It sticks with you, you remember your experience, you remember you actually physically doing it and engaging um, and investing in that, as opposed to just sitting down and something going through one ear and coming to the next one. Excellent, good. Practice, it's just, it's, there's more than All right, so in the, the, the therapy experience, what this, our theory says is your clients, those that you're working with, they will better experience the therapeutic experience by doing. All right, and if you're in a teaching setting, your students, those that you are imparting uh, to, they learn better by doing. All right, in group counseling, obviously. All right, the more uh, the group is engaged in terms of doing the experience, is the better that it is. All right, anything else on that? All right, so that's the idea behind experiential uh, learning or theory. Let's talk about um, what are the steps that's needed. So if you're going to be doing experiential learning uh, in, in your particular area, there's some key steps that must happen for experiential education to happen. So let's look at those steps. Well, step number one, there has to be preparation. So if we're talking about experiential learning, there must be some kind of preparation. In terms of content, it has to be content material that you're bringing into this experience. Number two, obviously, there has to be experience. All right, experiential learning, experiential education, there has to be an experiential element. Number three, there has to be the processing of the exercise, right? We must give an opportunity for the client, for the student, for the counselor, uh, the, 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 the students, the, the children, whoever it is, there must be an opportunity for them to process the activities that they've learned. All right, so three key ingredients to experiential learning. There has to be preparation, there has to be content, there has to be experience, and there has to be a processing of the exercise. Let me ask you this. Uh, did we see that today? Where did we see that today? Where did we see? Let, let's identify that we've seen that today. Have we seen that today? Mm -hmm. All right. So I heard yes. Tell me where did we see that today? Where was the preparation? Let's start with preparation. Did we see preparation today? Yes, we gave instruction for, uh, yeah, either the walking line or the work, what the exercise was going to be. All right, good. All right. Any other area that we saw preparation today? What about uh, experience? Was there experience today? Yes? Yes. All right, give me, give me an example. Going over the line, just being asked a question and being able to step forward. All right. All right, good. And what about the processing of the exercise? Did we see that today? Uh, in the group therapy, excellent. The journaling, excellent. Right? So we've been um, teaching this concept of reflective journaling. Journaling, this is an example of that. All right? So again, if we're going to have experiential education, there has to be preparation, uh, there has to be an experience, and there must be the processing of the exercise or the activities. With me on that, any questions, any comments? All right, let's move forward. I want to give you some examples um, of experiential learning or experiential education. All right, I put a, a lot on the screen, 
but it's intentional. All right, here's an example from your text. Wes talks about if I were teaching or if you were teaching uh, students in group counseling, one of the examples that you could uh, have them do or activities is in their group time or in their group therapy, you could ask that they would get out their reflective journals, which I just did, and you can have them reflect on the following. While you were in your group, uh, take note of who was participating, right? Or you may say to them, take note of who was influencing the group. What were some of the feelings, the primary feelings that was expressed during your group? What was the curative factors that you saw uh, in your group? So again, if you were doing an example, or a good example of experiential learning with uh, group counseling educators is to say to them, get out your reflective journal and in your group counseling time, take note of these things. You with me on that? Yeah. All right. Are, are you kind of thinking about when we did that? Mm -hmm. this group? Yeah. That's true, right? Uh, did you notice who was, perhaps you know, our group was short that we couldn't really tell who participated the most or who influenced, but if we had a, a longer time to experience that, right? We may also ask them to look at some of these things. Was there cohesiveness in the group? All right, in group counseling, this is a big factor, right? Uh, what were the norms? What were they, uh, what did they accept as part of their group? One example I think about uh, in a group that I was in, they accepted the norm of resistance. So they were resistant to the group leader. They just decided, we're gonna shut things down, we're not gonna to respond to the group leader. That was the norm. All right, you may also ask about what are the relationships? Is there alienation? Is there conflicts that's happening within the group? And we may also ask them to reflect on what stage is the group? Is it the beginning stage of the group or is it the working phase of the group? All right, with me on that? So that's one example of of what uh, experiential learning could look like. Any questions, any comments on that? Good? I think, all right. Let's move forward, and we're gonna talk just for the last few minutes here on types of groups that you might see in a school setting, all right? So we're talking today about experiential learning in a group setting. So we're gonna look at what are some of the types of groups that you may see in a group setting. But before I do that, I want you to listen to this clip and let's hopefully it works. Hello, you've reached the automated answering service of your school. In order to assist you in connecting to the right staff member, please listen to all options before making your selection. To lie about why your child is absent, press one. To make excuses for why your child did not do his homework, press 2. To complain about what we do, press 3. To cuss out staff members, press 4. To ask why you didn't get needed information that was already enclosed in your newsletter and several bulletins mailed to you, press 5. If you want us to raise your child, press 6. If you want to reach out and touch, slap, or hit someone, press 7. To request another teacher for the third time this year, press 8. To complain about bus transportation, press 9. To complain about school lunches, press 0. If you realize this is the real world and your child must be accountable for his or her own behavior, classwork, homework, and it's not the teacher's fault for your child or children's lack of effort, thank you and have a nice day. All right, good job. <laughs> Obviously not a real clip, but what can we draw from that clip about working in schools? We're talking about group counseling in a school setting. What, what, what can we draw from that? I think we have to kind of appreciate the dynamics of each individual student's kind of upbringing and their background to be able to kind of mold self. Because when they come to the counseling session, you don't know all the layers behind what the behaviors have been manifest, and you don't know what the backdrop is. So you have to really get an appreciation for that. Okay, good. So I'm hearing an appreciation uh, for the individual student. Good. Anybody else? What can that clip, <laughs> though it was funny, tell us about working in schools? Um, I heard frustration, like, okay, whatever. Whatever you want to talk about, it's, we, we got it without an answer. We're, we understand. We, I don't know. I heard frustration. Okay, good. Yeah, so working in schools, 
uh, for group counseling can be frustrating, right? Uh, but here are some thoughts I have now. Working in schools is, can be challenging, all right? Uh, working in schools is experiential by nature, all right? It's, it's moving. It's a living organism, so to speak, all right? So in a group counseling setting that's in schools, it's going to be experiential. Hence why this particular chapter is of benefit, all right? And then group counseling can effectively engage those experiences. So though it's challenging in a, in a, in a school setting, uh, this experiential learning can engage those activities. Does that make sense? All right, so let's look quickly at some of the types of groups that you will see or that you will do in a, a school setting. There's groups for children of divorce. So as you're thinking about what kind of groups that I may do in a school setting, one of those would be children of divorce, and you'll see that a lot in schools. And next, there's groups for at-risk youth, right? Urban adolescents, uh, children who are at risk academically, emotionally, socially, and the list goes on. Uh, there's prevention groups, right? Violence prevention, and you know, the list could just go on and on about the different types of prevention groups. There's also developmental groups where you're doing psychoeducational groups, all right? There's also remedial groups, groups for dealing with students who are having trouble academically. All right? And I think that might be the last one in that list. One more. There's also the school climate groups, right? Groups dealing with diversity, awareness, conflict resolution, uh, groups that deal with respect to self and others. Alright, so as you're thinking about counseling in groups, these are some of the potential groups. Any questions, any comments on that? Alright, on the screen, uh, just before we end today, I wanted to give you some resources. Uh, I can always get this to you in your um, Blackboard, uh, email this to you. But here are some good uh, resources in dealing with this idea of group counseling, and experiential uh, learning education. All right, so let's end today. What were the aha moments? Any aha moments? We have about another two to three minutes. What were your aha moments from today's uh, chapter? This, this idea, this theory, this practical experience of experiential learning. Any aha moments? No aha moments? I like the thought about kind of stratifying the groups in the school, that you can pick a cool focus on either you know, remedial, mm -hmm. you know, be it, you know, um, whatever groups you want to split up your, your students and, you know, and kind of focus on those aspects while they can in and all the different to the table. Good. Good. Any other aha moments? What about any questions? Any lingering questions behind? Any lingering questions? Anybody have any lingering questions from um, what we talked about today? All right. What about any muddy waters? <laughs> any area you would say, this is kind of muddy, you know, we need some clarity on, on, this, uh, on this topic. Some areas that I'm kind of iffy, kind of, you know, not too sure. I need you to kind of help me through. Any money waters? Then? Sure. So in terms of having a group, group session counseling, uh, sometimes you know the clients are resisting the person here, perhaps because they believe that or they think they perceive mm -hmm. that the person here do not or have the experience that they've been going through or such. And I get it, other people might be experiencing the same thing, but how do you Good. And you said a lot. And I'm thinking to, to Yadam, you're familiar with his, his name. He is the guru, so to speak, on guru counseling. And he does talk about resistance. And one of the things he talks about is, is you deal with it head on. So in the group, as the group 
good and you say, we're experiencing some resistance. Tell me, what is it that I can do to build and the word that you said, which is trust. So in one of the classes, advanced group counseling classes that I recently um, went through, you know, did a session on that, that came up in that particular class, which was resistant. The group was resistant, but you had to tackle that head on. We are sensing resistance. What can I do to build trust? All right? Good? All right, next week, on next class, we're going to talk about incorporating Christian uh, spirituality within this experiential learning model. Uh, so some of you, you've asked about that. Uh, some of our texts, uh, they, they do address that. So next week, we will talk about that. But just to give you uh, some, some things to think through, and remember, we want you to keep up with uh, your reading. So next week, how can we integrate spirituality into this experiential learning? Here's some examples uh, that uh, from today, which I felt like we would do that just before we close, from the cross the line activity, one of the things we could have done if we were integrating spirituality, Christian spirituality, into this particular class or that activity is, you could have changed the questions, and the questions could uh, look somewhat like this. Cross the line if you, quest, if you ever questioned your place in God. All right, remember we had the question about pressing your place in life, right? Pressing your place in God. Uh, cross the line if you've ever been hurt by someone in the church. All right, that would make it more practical. Uh, cross the line if you've ever struggled in your walk with Christ. All right, again, this is integrating the Christian spirituality into experiential learning. Uh, instructions may include uh, when someone crosses over the line, say it out loud, we are praying for you. All right? So again, this is a, an example of how we can integrate um, Christian principles into this. And then I'll close with this last extra, uh, example. In this particular uh, university, I think it's called Franc Franciscan University of Steubenville. All right? One of the things that they did in their social work program, you can look at that on the screen, students were asked to visit the house of worship with which they were unfamiliar or uh, they had not previously visited. And what they were asked to do was they were expected to reflect on their experience and compare and contrast the services to a typical Catholic Mass. Finally, they were to outline how they might use this experience as a professional. So this, this is a particular university who was living out or wanted to get their students um, into this idea of experiential learning, but integrating spirituality into it. All right, so we'll talk a lot more about that next week. Uh, make sure you're keeping up with your reading, uh, your assignments, and we will see you next week. Thank you.